Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. The young nation of Eritrea is often referred to as the North Korea of Africa. The country has jailed thousands of political prisoners, eliminated the independent press, and forces much of the population into indefinite military service. Border guards sometimes shoot to kill Eritreans fleeing the country. Now, President Isaiah Afewerki's government has long justified these measures as necessary for the country's security, given the threat from Eritrea's much larger neighbor, Ethiopia. Now, the two countries fought a 1998 to 2000 border war that killed as many as 100,000 people and forced many more from their homes. Now, though a ceasefire ended much of the shooting, the border between Eritrea and Ethiopia has remained heavily milita militarized ever since. But Ethiopia's new Prime Minister, Abi Ahmed, made reaching an agreement with Eritrea a priority, and in July, the two countries formally reached a peace agreement and restored diplomatic relations. Now, this peace deal raises questions as to whether Eritrea may begin to open up to the outside world and restore the rule of law. On this edition of Global Journalist, a look at the opportunity for a country its critics say is a giant prison for its population. Now, in a few moments, we'll talk to three experts who have been tracking political developments in Eritrea closely. But first, we're going to talk about press freedom and a group of journalists there who have been in prison for more than 15 years with virtually no outside contact. For this, we're going to bring in Arnaud Froger. He's the head of the Africa Desk with the Press Freedom Group, Reporters Without Borders in Paris. Arnaud, welcome. Hi, thanks. Well, give us just a picture, if you would, of what the media environment is like in Eritrea. What's it like to read or watch the news there? Oh, it's pretty hard, actually. Uh, you know, Eritrea is second from last in RSF's uh, 2018 Press Freedom Index and has been at the very bottom of the index for very long. Uh, only North Korea, uh, you mentioned in your introduction, is doing worse, which tells a lot about the situation in, in Eritrea. So ever since the massive crackdown back in uh, 2001, while the eyes uh, of the world were really riveted on the 9-11 terrorist attack in the U.S., there has been there has not been such a thing as uh, freedom of speech and freedom of information in Eritrea. Those who wanted to, to report freely have been thrown in jail or were forced to, to leave the country and the news outlets uh, were uh, shut down. So to speak, there is no news to read or to watch anymore uh, in uh, Isaiah Safiwoki's regime. Only Radio Arena, a Paris-based uh, radio station supported by RSF, uh, is uh, broadcasting independent information, but from Paris, and uh, it's a radio hosted by um, exiled Eritrean journalists. And so it sounds like there's just there's very little news there except for state media and what the state uh, wants to tell its people. What about just internet or telephone access there? Well, we know that the internet uh, penetration rates is one of the lowest in Africa, below two percent, and it's tightly and highly controlled. Uh, we also know that since October 2016, internet cafes uh, must register customers before they use internet, uh, making it, of course, uh, very uh, possible and easy to track their online activities. So even on the internet, uh, freedom of information is not guaranteed. And, you know, sometimes in some countries, uh, for example, in Uganda or in Tanzania, people have found refuge. Uh, on the internet to speak more freely and to provide uh, independent information, but that's not even possible in Eritrea. So we're talking about, it sounds like an extremely isolated country where the people who live there by and large are very much cut off from much of the world. But you mentioned that a lot of this repression began in 2001 at a time when actually a lot of the, the world's focus was on the events of the September 11th uh, and the terror attacks. You mentioned that the government initiated this big crackdown, then arrested thousands of political prisoners, uh, including many journalists. Tell us what happened to the reporters who were arrested at this time. Well, you, you have to know that in September 21, uh, only one year uh, after the end of the war with Ethiopia, neighboring Ethiopia, there was growing criticism uh, about the Eritrean regime, about the incomplete implementation of the Eritrean constitution, even uh, among the ruling party. So as a matter of fact, some politicians uh, from the ruling party published an opinion piece uh, in some newspapers, a very critical piece against the government's policy. And one morning they were all arrested, as well as journalists, uh, 
uh, from the independent uh, free news outlets uh, who were considered to act against the regime's interests. So from September 21, uh, there was no free and independent press allowed anymore uh, in Eritrea. Journalists were thrown in jail and forced to flee that country. It's been uh, 17 years and nothing has really changed uh, since that day. Well, how many journalists do we know are in prison there now? Well, um, Eritrea remains up to this day the largest prison for journalists uh, in sub-Saharan Africa with at least, according to our record, 11 journalists being detained, um, according to our such record. It's, it's very hard, as you might imagine, to keep track because we are dealing with a, a, a very landlocked country where there is no room for independent information at all. Uh, among the dozen of journalists arrested back in 2001, we believe that at least seven of them have died uh, in prison. One of the most famous journalists uh, being detained, uh, one of Eritrea's most talented writer, Dawid Isaac, uh, is still in jail since uh, 2001. And the last time someone saw him alive uh, was in 2010. It's a former prison guard. Uh, so we haven't had any news from him. So, I mean, it sounds like there's uh, at least a dozen journalists who have basically been disappeared for 17 years. Yes. Yes, and it's even hard to tell if Zeus were, we believe, are still in prison or still alive. Uh, we don't know for sure. And well, talk to us. What do we know about the prison conditions in which they've been held during this time? Well, we do not know for sure where each journalist uh, are being detained. What we know from the government is that they are considered as terrorists, as political opponents. We also know from a former prison guard I was uh, talking about earlier, who managed to flee Eritrea, that they are detained in very unhuman conditions. Uh, some of these prisoners, um, journalists included, are held in containers. Uh, in containers, to... you mean like shipping containers, like yeah, the steel containers used to move cargo? Yeah, exactly. Exposed to very severe heat, as you can imagine. Uh, sometimes they're uncuffed even during the day. Uh, and they also live uh, in complete isolation uh, from the world with no access to family members, no access to lawyer even. Well, I mean, the situation sounds grave. There has been this peace agreement with Ethiopia. I mean, is there room for optimism that things may change? Some of these reporters who have been imprisoned may be released, that there's going to be more openness now? Well, our hope is that given the new situation in Ethiopia, indeed, with the prime minister opening up the country, releasing the stronghold on fundamental uh, freedom and also making peace, as you mentioned, with Eritrea, the Eritrean regime will be left with no choice but to open up as well. Um, we are also advocating uh, for human rights issues uh, and especially the release of imprisoned journalists to be taken into account for any countries, any organization uh, willing to do business uh, with Eritrea. Eritrea is, is asking for the lift of the UN sanctions, for example, and we consider at Reporter Without Borders that the release of detained journalists is a prerequisite to do that. Well, Arnaud Froger, thanks so much for joining us. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. On today's program, we're talking about Eritrea, a repressive state often referred to as the North Korea of Africa. Now, Eritrea recently agreed to a peace deal with its arch enemy, Ethiopia, and that's led to much speculation about whether this may herald changes inside Eritrea. To talk more about this, we're going to bring in three people who have been following events there closely. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Salam Solomon. She's a multimedia journalist for VOA News. She's originally from Eritrea, and after coming to the U.S. was actually a host of Global Journalist for a period of time. Salam, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Also joining us from Brussels is Ande Berhan Wolde-Girgis. He was once a member of the Central Council of Eritrea's ruling party and had a number of jobs in the government, including governor of the Central Bank and ambassador to the European Union. He became disillusioned and left the government more than a decade ago to live abroad. He's now president of IRI Platform, a group that promotes open dialogue in Eritrean politics. Ande Berhan, welcome. Thank you very much. And on the line from Pleasure Geneva is Daniel McConan. He's the president of the Eritrean Law Society, a group of Eritrean lawyers living outside the country that advocate for the rule of law and democratic rights in Eritrea. Daniel, welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, Salam Solomon, let me start with you. Ethiopia and Eritrea have been in sort of an armed standoff, no war, no peace situation for 17 years. Um, what does this peace deal mean for ordinary Eritreans? Like, does it, does it change anything for the way people live their daily lives? 
when the peace deal was announced, we saw what it means for regular average air chance, people who haven't been able to see each other for 20 years, families torn apart because of the border conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea, were able to speak to each other for the first time, see each other for the first time. We saw people-to-people um, -people reconciliation ongoing uh, as we speak, uh, that people who are living in the border areas between Ethiopia and Eritrea are getting to see each other, uh, exchange ideas, and, and for the first time, uh, uh, some sort of hope uh, is 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 coming uh, to the people uh, of the two countries, but there are a lot of reforms that are um, uh, that have taken in Ethiopia since Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has taken uh, is taking the position to be the prime minister. Uh, but in Eritrea, um, yeah, a lot of unknowns are still remaining, and, and uh, th what the peace deal means for Eritrea is for uh, the government and Eritrea to look closer in the mirror. Uh, and face challenges that are within the country, including, as you mentioned earlier, uh, releasing of, of journals that have disappeared completely, uh, and, and, and you know, parliamentarians that were arrested during the conflict between the two countries. Um, you know, civil liberties have been curtailed as an, because of the border conflict. We're talking about freedom of uh, press. We're talking about uh, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of movement. Uh, and so a lot of uh, the civil liberties have been curtailed. So this would be uh, a time to take a close look at the mirror. Well, and Ibrahim Wolde Georgis, you, uh, as I mentioned, you were a senior official in the government until I think it was 2006. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, one of the features of Eritrea's human rights violations and an impediment to its economic growth is this issue of national conscription, where I think there's something like half of the total population of the entire country is conscripted into either the military or national service programs. Talk to us about that. Well, the national service was initially conceived as a strategy of uh, defense uh, in a volatile region in the Horn of Africa. But uh, since 2000, since the last uh, border war, it has been uh, changed to become indefinite. And this is in the context Indefinite meaning when you're conscripted into the military, there's no set date when you may be released from that military service, like you could spend 20, 25 years as a soldier. Exactly. And, uh, and you have no say in was, the matter. No. In fact, what's happened is by making it endless, the system deprives young men and women of normal life, normal family life, and uh, of course, uh, a engagement in a gainful employment where they can also get to due compensation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, it's become indefinite, and the reason is of course national security, because as earlier as mentioned earlier, the state of no war, no peace, uh, in the context of continued Ethiopian occupation of sovereign Eritrean territory, uh, was used as a pretext to make it endless, not only that, but also to postpone the national elections which were planned immediately after the ratification of the Constitution in 1997. In fact, the application of the Constitution has been postponed. And of course, there has been ruthless suppression in the media, as Arno, Arno was uh, explaining earlier, the government control, the government owns actually the media and controls the message in an effort to cultivate uniformity of uh, uh, thinking or of thought uh, molded in accordance with the government's propaganda. So in other words, it sounds like this sort of frozen state of war was used as the rationale to effectively force people to work, you know, most of their entire working lives for the government or in the army and deny a lot of basic freedoms. But if I could turn this to Daniel McConan, tell us about the border war with Ethiopia and the perceived threat afterwards. Like, how was that used within the population to justify this? I mean, did people buy this rationale? Uh, of course, the people do not buy this excuse, but we all know that uh, for the last 20 years, the, the major excuse for the government to suppress fundamental rights and freedoms and to keep the state in a perpetual uh, 
state of emergency has always been the unresolved border conflict with Ethiopia. And that's why we somehow um, express a sense of optimism when this new peace, uh, peace process or initiative was um, announced by the Ethiopian Prime Minister, which of course was then uh, followed up again uh, by the Eritrean president. So in that sense, I think it's important to acknowledge um, that there is some degree of hope for peace between the two countries to to happen or to materialize after after a long wait, uh, but there are also concerns, real and genuine concerns, that at least on the part of Eritrea, there are no reliable state institutions that should enable the government or the nation to to take this uh, new initiative to its next uh, next level. And as far as my understanding is concerned, actually, this doesn't only have to be seen as a border conflict between the two countries. Of course, that is the, the most dominant official narrative. But I think there is another angle from which we also need to understand this issue. And that is, according to my own understanding, it's something which also takes place in the form of a long sustainable uh, or a long history of uh, rivalry between the two governments, in particular between the two major political parties in Ethiopia and in, in Eritrea, which are the People's Front for Democracy and Justice, or PFDJ in Eritrea, and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, in Ethiopia. And this, of and course, was, I... was the ruling party in Ethiopia, the TPLF, for many years. But actually, what's happened there, as you mentioned, is that a different faction of that ruling party is ascendant now, as represented by the current prime minister there, who has been able to help initiate this peace process. But Salem Solomon, if I could turn this to you then, uh, you know, Daniel was talking about some of the optimism that people have felt with this uh, peace deal being reached. And after President Afewerki visited uh, Ethiopia and made this historic deal, there were huge crowds in the streets of Addis Ababa. There were these great scenes of jubilation. You heard about how phone links were restored and people in Ethiopia were calling random numbers in Eritrea just to hear someone's voice in the other country. What's the re what was the reaction like inside Eritrea? You know, uh, the expectations of the people have been, you know, a lot of Eritreans, for instance, uh, for the past 20 plus years have sacrificed a lot uh, and, and uh, you know, has sacrificed their civil, civil liberties. They've sacrificed um, their freedom. They've sacrificed their children during the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And so when the announcement came that there's going to be a peace declaration, an agreement, uh, and also a concession of land from the Ethiopian side after a border uh, boundary commission in, in The Hague decided that after a war between the two countries, the land was being awarded to Eritrea. And that was announced by um, Abiy Ahmed that they were going to fully and completely implement uh, the decision by the international court, uh, the willingness uh, and the activity coming from the Eritrean government side was very encouraging uh, for uh, the world to see. Two weeks into the announcement, we didn't hear anything from inside Eritrea until the president said that, uh, yes, we're going to meet with the prime, the prime minister of Ethiopia, which was a surprise because other prime ministers, of, Ethiopian prime ministers, have made the same gesture. It's just uh, that Abiy Ahmed's um, uh, you know, uh, just are carried more weight is what we have seen. Uh, just to give... Uh, and so within audience, Eritrea, it sounds like the people waited to sort of express themselves openly until they could get a read on how their president felt about the offer. It also shows you the power structure in the country. Uh, the power structure of Eritrea, for instance, uh, you know, the government... Uh, uh, is you know centered uh, in in uh, the government, the president of the Eritrea saying uh, that yes we're going to make peace today as we speak uh, you know this regional integration and and peace uh, is uh, making some sort of headway with the prime minister of Ethiopia uh, and Somalia uh, and uh, uh, foreign ministers of the three countries going to Djibouti so there is an interesting regional uh, push for uh, uh, peace. Uh, moving forward. But from within Eritrea, we have yet to see more uh, uh, reforms. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, officials were saying that they're going to cut the military. Uh, but uh, they don't specifically address what the specifics of, of, of these uh, promises mean. 
for instance, um, uh, uh, you know, relative to, to its population, Eritrea has the largest star standing army in the world. Um, that's very important to understand. When we say national service, we're not just talking about the military. Everybody, everybody was on standby, whether you are a journalist working in a ministry of information or you are uh, somebody working in other ministries, you're on standby in case well, something Salem, happens. I, I think we want to pick up on this point again in a moment. We do need to go to a break to remind our listeners that they're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about the prospects for change in Eritrea, one of the most repressive countries in the world. This follows a peace agreement with neighboring Ethiopia. We're joined by Salem Solomon, a multimedia reporter for VOA News, and a Berhan Wolde Girgis, a former Eritrean ambassador to the EU, and Daniel McConan, the president of the Eritrean Law Society, a lawyers group based outside the country. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our videocast on YouTube. And Eberhard Wolde Georgis, if I could come back to you, you were a part of this regime. Give us, if you could, just a sense as to how they might view the risks and rewards of carrying out this peace deal with Ethiopia, given that they have long used Ethiopia as sort of the bogeyman to justify all these repressive measures. I think there was um, considerable initial optimism when the peace deal was made. But I believe that if this peace is to remain viable, there is a need for change in Eritrea as well. There is, of course, a wind of change in Ethiopia. But, uh, of course, there are also challenges in Ethiopia itself. In the case of Eritrea, it's a one-man show. There is no parliament, there is no cabinet, there is no consultative process. A peace agreement made by a single person making decisions alone can also as e unravel as easily. There is really no guarantee that this would hold. And uh, we don't really know, the people of Eritrea do not know, even the senior officials in the government do not know what's really uh, happening with respect to the discussions, with respect to the deals that are being made. And they are, everyone inside Eritrea, outside Eritrea, is learning of these things from, the, from third parties, the Ethiopian and international media. So I think there are concerns in Eritrea. If this, piece me, if this window of opportunity is to be accessed, then there must also be peace within Eritrea. There must be rule of law. The, there must be the implementation of the constitution. The political and economic space must But all, if all this happens, there are going to be, re I would think there were going to be some repercussions for President Afewerki, given that he has played the largest role in sort of planning and carrying out these massive human rights violations that have taken place over the last 20 years. So what would be his incentive to allow that to go forward? Definitely, President Isaias cannot continue on the basis of business as usual. There will be enormous pressure now that Eritreans would fully focus on the need for democratic governance in the country, for the need for the rule of law in the country, the end of the rule of man, the end of this brutal repression that has been explained by the other speakers, the indefinite incarceration of senior political, uh, senior political leaders of the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you have today is a situation in which Eritreans can, for the first time in 20 years, focus attention, energy, and of course, all effort towards bringing about democratic transformation from within Eritrea. People have had enough, and it's time for change. Well, Daniel so, McConan, if you could if you could pick up on that point, then, because Eritrea, as we mentioned earlier in the program, it is under UN sanctions. It is under an arms embargo. I believe those are up for renewal in the UN Security Council in November. What role is there for outsiders like the United Nations, like the United States, other countries, in trying to leverage this moment of openness to promote change in Eritrea? Uh, there is some possibility, of course, for UN sanctions against Eritrea to be lifted based on what's currently happening between Eritrea and Ethiopia uh, because Eritrea is actually now reaching out not only to Ethiopia. As previously mentioned by Salem, uh, uh, there is a process, a, a new uh, 
political process which was announced today that the government, uh, the, the foreign, ministers, foreign ministers of Ethiopia, uh, Somalia and Eritrea are now actually traveling to Djibouti. And one of these, uh, the main objectives of this trip is apparently to convince the government of Djibouti to come to this regional cooperation so that uh, the sanctions imposed against Eritrea could be uh, lifted up. This can be seen probably as one positive development as far as the uh, interest of the, the, the Eritrean government is concerned. But if I have to comment in the broader sense of the national interest of Eritrea, it is equally important that other national issues of Eritrea, the issue of democratization, the issue of democratic accountability, the issue of rule of law, the, 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 the end to the ongoing um, situation of uh, gross human rights violations need to be addressed, of course. Unless these issues are resolved in a meaningful way, I think this new peace process with Ethiopia uh, uh, will, it's unlikely for it to have a lasting uh, impact for both countries. And uh, these are actually some of the core cool shortcomings which have been already discussed by, two, by my two other colleagues. And, uh, and that's why I believe there is a lot of uncertainty as to how will, as to what will come next. It's good to see that the two governments are sitting, coming to their sense. But there are many, many unresolved issues, critical structural shortcomings, at least on the part of Eritrea, which can only be resolved by meaningful um, political reform within the system. Because at the end of the day, we should remember that a government or a country which is not at peace with its own self cannot be at peace with its neighboring countries. This is the most uh, uh, fundamental observation. Well, well Daniel, our, our time grows short. I want to give the last word to Salem Solomon then. How do you see Eritrea evolving over the next three years? Are you optimistic that in 2022 we will be sitting here having a much more positive discussion about a country that has really been you know, one of the most repressive in the world? I'm very optimistic that uh, change uh, in Eritrea will come from the people. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking to the challenges that Eritrea might have, I think the main challenge has been accountability. Uh, there are, as we speak, refugees that are uh, seeking refuge in neighboring countries like Ethiopia, um, in Israel, uh, uh, people who, Eritreans who fled the restrictions that they were facing due to national service and other uh, limitations, uh, uh, you know, lack of, uh, uh, you know, freedom of religion that people are running away from. From Eritrea, and so there's a lot, thousands of thousands of Eritreans awaiting in limbo what this peace deal means for them in terms of you know being forced back to a fragile situation. I'm very optimistic that uh, if change comes, it has to come from the people, uh, even when the region is crowded. Russia well, last week. I'm sorry, Salem. We're we're just out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Arnold Froger, Salem Solomon, Anna Berhan Wolde Girgis, and Daniel McConan. Our producers this week are Idam Kasaye and Yan Chi Shu, and Maggie Duncan is visual editor. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.